What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, the Museum of the Forgotten Fistograph series. We'll continue this conversation with you concerning the complete history of boxing. Now, I have a real good one here for you. The newspaper headlines had their works cut out for them. You see, there were two world championship contests that took place on the same night of February 22nd, 1910. And what was interesting about them? They were hundreds of miles apart. Let me give you an example of what I'm saying. Lightweight Ad Wargas would take a complete beating, was even dropped on the 22nd round in his contest with the world lightweight champion battling Nelson. But what was interesting about this contest, Nelson would take a beating himself and he would be stopped in 40 rounds. Now Ad Wargas would now become the new world lightweight champion. Huh, nothing interesting about that, I guess, huh? But the contest took place at Point Richmond, Virginia. But don't forget I mentioned to you that there was a second contest that same evening, and that was hundreds of miles apart. An Italian bantamweight contender by the name of Frankie Conley would knock out current world bantamweight champion Abe Battelle in 42 rounds. So what's the issue here? <laughs> well, hadn't you noticed? During that time, a lot of the small men championship fights would end in 40 rounds, in 42 rounds. Some ended in 38 rounds. Joe Gans battling Nelson, 42 rounds, and Goldfield. Ad Wargas battling Nelson, 40 rounds. And this contest took place in Point Richmond, Virginia. Frankie Conley and Abe Tell took place in California. That won 42 rounds. And on and on I can mention championship fights in those lower divisions all day long. That happened that way. <laughs> but I just want you to be aware of how interesting that was. Now, March 17th of 1910, the colored middleweight world champion, Boston Bone Crusher, his name was Sam Langford, he knocks out Andrew Haynes, better known as Fireman Jim Flynn. He would end the contest in eight rounds at Los Angeles, California. Fireman Jim Flynn. He was born December 24th, 1879, and he died April 12th, 1935 in Hoboken, New Jersey. Now, Hoboken had some great fighters that came around during the early years. And we'll talk about those fighters as the series goes by. On April 27th, 1910, the world middleweight champion, Michigan assassin Stanley Ketchum would face the Boston Bone Crusher, Sam Langford. And the contest would go six rounds. It would be a no decision contest, which means that the middleweight championship title was not at stake. But that contest would be in contingence that Sam Langford would get another crack opportunity, this time officially for the title. Unfortunately for Sam Langford, and of course Stanley Ketchum, but Sam Langford would never get that second opportunity for the middleweight championship title because Stanley Ketchum would unfortunately be shot and killed by Walter Dipley. That's a story within itself. And Sam Langford would never again get an opportunity on paper to get a shot at a world title. Now, there was an agreement with him and Jack Johnson, speaking of Sam Langford. In fact, Joe Woodman and his camp helped put the money up for Jack Johnson to campaign for his bout with Noah Busso, Tommy Burns. And Jack Johnson, when he finally got the opportunity in Sydney, Australia, to face Tommy Burns, Lou McIntosh had put up the money and he decided to do the promotion for that contest. Well, Sam Langford would never get that opportunity. He was reneged on a deal in facing Jack Johnson for a rematch. In fact, Joe Jeanette and Sam McVeigh would get that opportunity. 1909. But Sam Langford was somewhat of a good sport about it, but he called out every single contender and or champion from the welterweights. I mean, going down to the lightweights with 
Joe Gans in 1903, but going all the way up to the heavyweight division, including Jack Dempsey and Boilermaker Jim Jeffries and many others. May 19th of that same year, former middleweight champion, the Illinois Thunderbolt, Billy Papke. He was from Chicago, Illinois. He would knock out a former Stanley Ketchell opponent by the name of Joe Thomas in 16 rounds in San Francisco, California. Now, William Herman Pappy Sr. stood five foot nine inches. He was a middleweight. He was out of Spring Valley, Illinois. He had 63 total bouts, two-time world middleweight champion, and he faced Stanley Ketchell, Hugo Kelly, Joe Thomas, Frank Klaus, George Compartier, Frank Mantell and Cyclone Johnny Thompson, Bob Moha, just to name a few. He was an outstanding fighter. But I remember the night we were reading about the fight when Stanley Ketchum would face him. And Papke would wear these G-strings, if you will, of boxing trunks, <laughs> somewhat underwear. And Stanley Ketchum said, I'm not getting in the ring with this man like this. And they threatened Stanley Ketchum's purse, so he had no choice but to face him. And that was some contest. But lightweight Packer McFarlane, who was a former champion, and Freddie Welch, who would become a future world lightweight champion. Matter of fact, Freddie Welch would lose his title to the Ghetto Wizard. Benny Leonard. And this contest went 20 rounds. It was a draw in London. McFarlane stood five foot seven inches. He had a 69 inch reach. He weighed 131 to 133 pounds. He had a record of 106 wins, 50 knockouts, one loss, six draws. He was in a ring with Jimmy Britt and Freddie Welch, Mike Gibbons, and Jack Britton. June 10th, world middleweight champion, Stanley Ketchell, knocks out Jim Smith of Westchester, New York. He was at the National Sporting Club. Stopped him in five rounds, and it would be his last title defense. To the Michigan assassin, Stanley Ketcher, would rush to the ring. He batters Smith in five rounds, jumps on the ropes, and he would wave to the crowd as if he knew that would be his last contest. Very interesting story when we take a look at Stanley Ketchell's bio. June 27th, world welterweight champion Harry Lewis defends his title against young Joseph. Eight rounds in London, England. And Harry Lewis become a champion. We defeat Frank Mattel, January 23rd, 1908. Third round knockout. Lewis knocks out Honey Boy Medley, April 20th, 1908. For the World Welterweight Championship title. Stopped him in four rounds. On June 15th, 1906, Harry Lewis, who was 19 years old, would receive a six-round draw. The World Lightweight Championship contest against Old Master. Joe Gans. Gans was 30 years old. The contest took place at the National Athletic Club in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, July 4th of 1910, the world heavyweight champion, Jack Johnson, who was known as the Galveston Giant, would become the first black world heavyweight champion when he would face the heavyweight champion at that time, James J. Jeffries, who was 35 years old. Now, when I say he became the world heavyweight champion. Now, he was champion in 1908 when he defeated Noah Busso, Tommy Burns. But he would solidify his title in 1910 when he would take on James J. Jeffries. Because Jeffries in 1905 would relinquish his title. He retired. And he was undefeated coming into this particular fight. So everyone always felt that Jeffries was the true champion. And this happened throughout history with Ali and Frazier and many others. But this fight was probably the fight that set the stage for the black-white fighters duking it out and having these money problems and even getting fights between the two because they were afraid of the riots that happened after this fight. This fight took place in Reno, Nevada. And all in New York and Chicago and Detroit, there were riots everywhere. And Jack Kearns, who was the manager of J 
Jack Dempsey used that excuse along with Tex Rickard as to why they didn't want to fight another black fighter. Wasn't necessarily the case. Harry Wills in 24, and we'll get to that, there was a written contract. So if there was a written contract, then that means they didn't worry about that at the time. But in 24, there was a written contract with Harry Wills and Jack Dempsey. Dempsey didn't honor the contract. In fact, he even allowed himself to be suspended out of the state of New York. And all his fights had to be fought in a championship fight, I should say, in either Philadelphia and Chicago. Like I said, we'll get to that when we get to Jack Dempsey's career. Now, I believe I mentioned this to you. The announcer, Billy Jordan, was in the ring with Jack Johnson and Jim Jeffries' fight. And he introduced some former world champions, middleweights, light heavyweights, and heavyweights. He introduced Ruby Rob, Bob Fitzsimmons, who was a three-weight division champion. He introduced Stanley Ketchell, who was a former two-time middleweight champion. He introduced A. Battelle, Bantamweight, featherweight champion. He introduced John L. Sullivan, who's the America's bare knuckle champion. He introduced Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, who was a light heavyweight champion. He didn't introduce the Barbados Joe Walcott, Barbados Demon. He didn't introduce the Boston Bone Crusher, Sam Langford. He didn't introduce Joe Jeanette, the Iron Man of West Hoboken. He did not introduce Sam McVeigh, the Oxnard Cyclone. And he didn't introduce Joe Gans, who was briefly there for a moment before he had to jump back on the train and go back to Baltimore to his mother's house, and he would die two weeks later. Shows you the times. But also goes to show you, when Jack Johnson would finally get in the ring with Jeffries, he would battle him for 15 rounds. The fight was scheduled for 15. But before the fight would be over, Johnson wanted to make sure he took care of Jeffries, because you never know how the decision would go, although Jeffries was taking a beating throughout the entire fight. And once that happened, and Corbett, Gentleman Jim Corbett, who was a heavyweight champion as well, would shout out racial slurs constantly to Jack Johnson, calling him the N-word, Yellow Street, a buffoon, a monkey. Everything in the book was said to Jack Johnson from Corbett, who was somewhat the poster child of boxing during that time. And Johnson would get rid of Jim Jeffries before the round was over. Oh, riots all over the place. Chicago and New York and Detroit. Men were hung. Little boys were beaten half to death by grown men. This is what happened after the Jack Johnson fight and Jim Jeffries. I'm Scrapbook Boxing. The Museum of the Forgotten Fistigoff Series. Stating all great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. We'll continue this conversation with you in our next video. Thanks for watching. Be well. Peace.